The United in Compassion Medicinal Cannabis Symposium will be held in Sydney from the 9th to the 11th of October 2020. For more information and to book your ticket, click on events under the community tab at fxmedicine.com.au. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Danielle Brown, who's a naturopath and early career researcher completing her honours in 2019, investigating the absorption of medicinal cannabis in patients with glioblastoma multiforme. Her research journey has taken her overseas to present at international conferences, inspiring further study in integrative oncology. Her previous profession as a sustainability practitioner has inspired further research into environmental drivers of health with a focus on the light environment and circadian biology. Danielle's clinical interest is in integrative medicine and in particular supporting patient-centred outcomes in cancer management through an informed evidence base. Welcome warmly to FX Medicine, Danielle Brown. How are you going? Hi Andrew, thank you for that welcome. I'm good, thanks. We're talking about medicinal cannabis, and, and I saw your poster at the recent um, NHAA, Naturopaths and Herbalists Association of Australasia, um, Centenary Conference 2019, and we're, it was on the medicinal a- actions of, of cannabis, anti-cancer actions of cannabis. So let's talk about these. What are they? Because we talk about cannabis ameliorating symptoms, but not a direct anti-cancer action. Yeah, um, that area is, is it's still you know very much in its early exploration. I think um, in understanding what the mechanisms are, but there's a broad range of mechanisms being identified, such as um, <clears throat> anti-proliferation um, properties, um, your know, anti-cancer, apoptosis, and autophagy, and then they have all their really fantastic biological pathways that are developing and constantly kind of, I guess, being elucidated um, on how it is that it's functioning in the body to get these outcomes. Um, but in saying that, this this research, I think if there was a paper um, in ni- about in the uh, mid-70s to early 80s that <clears throat> that was the first time they investigated anti-cancer actions of medicinal cannabis in a trial it was. So, it's definitely why we say it's not, you know, we're, we're still foundations in trying to understand what these actions are. It's something that has been um, identified much earlier than today. Yeah. You mentioned autophagy and apoptosis, and they're sort of kind of like along the same lines, but not quite. Can we go into that a little bit and just clear up what exactly are they and how are they different? Yeah, yeah. So um, in my understanding, apoptosis is when the cell is you know, triggered as being mutagenic or, you know, not functioning in in its correct manner. And then the cell will rise and then be collected up and taken away by the immune system and so on. Uh, Whereas autophagy more is that element where it it can come in and recycle certain parts of the system. Um, I think that's from my understanding. Does that seem correct? We, well, yeah, to my understanding, which is probably less than yours, but <laughs> but you know, this is very interesting to me with regards to the stress response. Whereas autophagy is initiated to recycle, is it malfunctioning components or is it just extra components, um, unnecessary components? I don't know the actual mechanism of autophagy. I think that in the beginning, um, probably if we go back when I first came into this subject and did this giant review on um, looking at medicinal cannabis use in oncology as a broad factor from the 1970s on to 2017, um, we did pull out, uh, working with different different um, people at Endeavour College, we pulled out a few different elements trying to understand what are these pathways, what are the proposed mechanisms and how there's how does autophagy change from apoptosis? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I can't really talk specifically on that 
that's, it gets a little bit out of my realm yeah. <laughs> to um, be confident in understanding the difference, whether it's, you know, but it is, I think that's a split is apoptosis, you know, we've, we've got to, we've got to get rid of the cell autophagy is that ability, different triggers that then allow that cell to break down in a way that's not as apocalyptic, I guess, as apoptosis. Yeah. You know, we know about medicinal cannabis. That, I mean, it's so controversial, even though there's a, there's a hedge towards the positive, but there, it's not without issues. Um, certainly, historically, it's been lambasted and, and treated incorrectly and, and marketed against. But why is there a hesitation overall for its use still in medicine today? Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question, that one, and one that can definitely be unraveled over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think you know, from from what I've read and my experience reading through the literature, there are times when there is you, you do have to take a precautionary approach and know that this medicine isn't for everyone. It's it, it's not a panacea, and I think the approach. Caution, uh, having hesitation is is potentially a good way to go ahead um, rather than going in full ball and then getting, you know, a, a adverse um, events or side side effects coming out later on. Um, but of course, there is that broader context where it has been stigmatized, you know, politically in the past. And there was actually a really interesting paper that um, oh, a paper there was I was listening to a. Um, a podcast it was a bit philosophical, but they were talking about the sitting with um ambiguity mm. and being okay with the uncom sitting in that unknown and mm. the uncomfortability yeah. of it. And I think it's it, it's difficult when you're looking in the medical model to sit with that unknown. So that's why I think the hesitancy is there because we're going, Oh, what about the evidence base? What does the evidence tell us? And you know, yet we can look at the evidence and still there's a personal experience of the G, the doctor that's prescribing or who has that intention to prescribe. They'll take their personal experience into, um, obviously you can't get away from your own values, mm. into consideration when looking to treat a patient with medicinal cannabis. So then you know, you've got this double entendre. You're like, well, here's the evidence. And like, oh, hang on. There's a bit of values that I'm not happy with in yeah. using this for this person. So it is it su kind of, such an emotionally charged issue, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when we're looking, though, at, at you know, maybe a physical hesitancy for its use. What about, I mean, let's say tolerability with somebody undergoing cancer therapy who's got raised liver enzymes, for instance, because of the cancer therapy, you know, mm -hmm. would that be a reasonable hesitancy for use? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's something that has to be considered, I guess. Um, and, you know, importantly in, in this environment when it is becoming more of a People are more aware of it. Patients are more aware of it. Practitioners um, and being able to flag these issues is quite important, you know, such as liver issues and certain enzymes, what's going on there. Is the person, if, you know, in oncology, are they on dexamethasone? Do we have to be a bit more wary and cautious around THC application? There's, there's definitely scopes there. What's the issue there? I think it's just at a really high dose of THC, you can get some really poor side side effects, uh -huh. you know, adverse events. Yeah. Um, but that's I think that's using THC as a um, on its own as a single as entity, an, yeah, as an isolate, as yeah. opposed to looking at it as a, um, a, a a cannabis based medicine. I, I was going to ask about that with regards to, I guess you could put this into tolerability or dosing strategies, which I wanted to ask you about next. But when you're looking at a drug, so if you're looking at paracetamol or for our American listeners, acetaminophen, um, then you've got one molecule repeated again and again and again. When you've got cannabis, you've got which cannabis species, um, which strain, which cultivar, which cultivar, is it chemically constrained, like you mentioned, with regards to high THC or only THC or very much only THC, or is it a diverse, more natural product with, you know, lots of terpenes and, you know, what is the ratio of all of these quote unquote active components? And I put quote unquote in there because I think there's so much more than just THC versus CBD. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but like, is that 
part of the issue with tolerability and therefore hesitation of use is that the doctors who are prescribing this don't know what to prescribe. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think so. And, and, you know, the, there are a lot of courses out there that, you know, that, that um, practitioners can go along to and, and, and get more familiar and understanding of this plant. Yep. Um, but even then, we're also working with an individual who's going to have different, their endocannabinoid system is going to interact differently. Um, and there's lots of different confounders that perhaps need to be understood. And so this idea of, you know, is there a population-based um, dosing? Like mm. if we go back to Panadol or Paracetamol, you know, where you take two tablets every four to six hours. When we're looking at medicinal cannabis, it's definitely not taking two drops. Yeah. You know, three times a day for everyone. But I am very much reminded that um, Professor David Caldicott um, Mm -hmm. says, you know, this may seem scary at first, but when you think about how we titrate quite readily, quite freely, quite acceptedly, um, the use of, say, gabapentin or pregabalin, um, Mm -hmm. and we titrate those doses for pain relief, then it really becomes, oh, is that all we do? (laughs) <laughs> so, yeah. so as long as yeah. they have a, an analogy that they're already using, these doctors then seem to become comfortable with, okay, so I just need to titrate the dose. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, when we're looking at medicinal cannabis being used in oncology specifically, we are working with individual drug doses for the most part yeah. based on body surface area. So it does seem a space where if it's going, like, medicinal cannabis use is increasing and this area in oncology does provide a platform for it to be comfortable, perhaps, with mm. in terms of dosing. Um, but, you know, then looking at other ca- outcomes such as therapeutic potential and what kind of actions are we driving and whatnot, that's still in development. But I think it's an interesting space to see how it's dosed because potentially you have the practitioners who are, are comfortable with that element of titration, dose titration and going to the individual now, you actually covered something very interesting with regards to dosing um, in your poster that you presented at the NHAA uh, conference, and that was intratumoral dosing. Yeah, so this is a trial um, done by Guzman and others um, in 2006, um, and it was looking at THC being uh, injected intracranially into direct into brain tumours. Um, it's a very fascinating um, study, and one of its one of the kind, of course. Um, you know, there's not a lot of human studies on medicinal cannabis, and um, this is probably one of the most recent. Um, so to be able to get in and you know directly inject THC into a tumor and look for the responses, and then analyze um, the the tumor and um, different cannabinoid receptors and understand what's happening is very exciting, and it did have, it, you know, it, it did have a positive outcome in terms of survival time. Really, you know, it was a, a very small, you're looking at very small cohort, and I think only. Yeah, sure. um, That's a really interesting. A, it's a really, I mean, controversial but interesting way of injecting a therapeutic. Um, because know, we, yeah. we know about the issues of therapeutics trying to cross the blood-brain barrier. You know, to actually complete that, I mean, that would have been an ethical nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I can't imagine the, the path that <laughs> went through there. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty exciting though, right? They're you're injecting it into a tumour. But we are looking at a, um, a population that it was a glioblastoma multiform. Um, so this this population... You kind of you you've got to go all out because we've got to survive a time in less than a year, and you know how are we going to get the best patient centered outcomes for these people? Exactly. So, what were the results? What happened with these patients? So there was nine in total, yeah. um, in part of this trial, um, and a THC solution was administered uh, at different times, starting at days three to six after a surgery, and it was at a lower at point three mils a minute with a syringe pump, um, and that had a subcutaneous reservoir. Um, but ultimately, the the data shows that there was an increased survival time. Um, for, for these patients that received the intratumoral injections of THC. And it, I think it's important to note that the THC was um, plant-based as well, obviously standardised, but not a 
I slept. So, like I'm, t- like, I'm thinking about the actual preparation of that drug. Like, mm. you've got sterilisation issues. I mean, this, they must have gone all out. This is quite amazing research. It really is. It really is. I, I, and I, I know when I first come across that, I had to double read it. I was like, oh, it's, it's a cranial <laughs> injection? Where, what is happening here? Wh- which country was that carried out in, by the way? It was in Madrid, yeah, Spain. We'll, we'll yeah. definitely put up the link so that people can read that paper, if it's a full paper. Um, yes. Hopefully yeah. it is, yeah. Real, that's yeah. just riveting. <laughs> that's a, but but yeah. I'm wondering if any subsequent work has been done or is that are they the only group that's done this work? Um, in terms of intracranial, mm. yes, I've not definitely not come across any of that. I know there's you know there's a, there's a handful of trials in motion at the moment, but not using it in this manner. So mm. what else are we talking about with regards to you know dosing strategies? What about different types of cancer and uh, looking for different desired effects? Like, you know, traditionally it's been used as an anti-emetic, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the data actually will cover, um, looks at anti antiemesis as an action for medicinal cannabis. And I guess it's interesting, you know, if we go back to it's the... the um, the literature review was part of a couple of years ago that's yet to be published. Um, but there was a poster, and this I took this poster was um, delivered at Society of Integrative Oncology, uh, which was really exciting. So we had to get that one-on-one interaction with oncologists who really like they want this information, they need this information for mm. patients. Mm. Um, but this, yeah. This is, so if I can introduce that poster a little, it was uh, that literature review. There was a total of 104 papers included in the literature review, and 24 of them were human trials. And predominantly, they were looking at the antiemetic effect of medicinal cannabis, and it was across all different kind of dosing, starting from 1975 through to the late 1990s. Um, and then we have some appetite stimulant actions um, and looking at the analgesics effects as well. Um, and most of these t- had really positive outcomes except for the ones that were dosed quite incredibly high and didn't have great patient tolerance. So uh-huh. you can kind of understand like, okay, that's why you'd get that report that it didn't work as well as it wasn't as effective as hope because they were taking incredibly high doses. Sorry, can I just clarify that? Incredibly high doses, are we talking about an isolate here? Didn't um, work or are we talking about, you know, overriding some other pain control system, say, for instance? So I, I think for the most part it was um, it was looking at THC, high right. THC dosing right. and in capsules. So in, and, 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 you know, going up and above 15 milligrams at one time and, 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 you know, four doses over four-hour intervals showed it didn't really have the greatest outcomes yeah. in terms of patient um, compliance or, or, or want to continue yeah. to taking it. You um, know, th- this smacks of what Simon Eckerman and I were talking about, um, his his research into, now what was it? I, and and I do have to talk about a, a product here because it that was the focus of the research, but I think it was Epidiolex. Um, versus, you know, standard pain therapies for, was this chronic pain that he was talking about? Um, there was a vast discordance, if you like, or a vast variation in cost, which was interesting, mm. but the mm. effect per dose was skewed. It was really quite weird. Whereas when you had a much more balanced product, certainly higher in the terpenes and the flavonoids, that mm-hmm. it had a much greater effect. Is that what you're coming to the conclusion? Of? Yeah, it does. The, the literature is definitely reflecting that, that, you know, um, your cannabis-based medicines, which are the whole plant extract that has all the elements, you know, you've got your key cannabinoids um, and then flavonoids, as you said, and terpenes. And it's showing that in terms of patient compliance, you the, the cannabis-based medicines from a whole plant are much more tolerated and therefore, you know, you can argue that if they're more tolerated by the patient and you're using this product in a clinical trial, then perhaps the efficacy of that will be, you get much truer representation than if we're using an isolate that doesn't have the 
best tolerability, but however is termed as medicinal cannabis. And then that fills into the knowledge that the, the database and you've got this skewed data where, you know, someone's this group A had medicinal cannabis and group B had medicinal cannabis, but one was plant-based extract and one was an isolate. And you've got these different tolerabilities and outcomes. And I think that, you know, coming back to that first point, why is there hesitation? Well, we've got data telling that's not specific and it's, you know, what plant have we used? What have we done? What's in it? Yeah. Then you're going to get confusion around, well, why, how can we use this medicine when there's no really any congruency? Yeah, yeah. I think we need to be mindful that this is, of course, not one medicine, but a group of medicines in one plant. And we need to be informed about all of these constituents so that we can make an informed treatment decision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I I get a little bit of like a a bone to pick about when people say medicinal cannabis is a a medicine once you standardize it. There's a little bit of like, oh, hang on, you know, (laughs) acknowledging my own bias of (laughs) naturopath. Yeah. And, you know, we're working with herbal medicine. It's a plant that, you know, it's only through us and as a way to understand what's happening, we standardize and label something. Yeah outcome but you know there's so many other factors as you know we can see from the research from Didi Mieri what he's bringing into the into the field is outstanding and you know moving beyond CBD and THC and the likes of this into your more minor what it suggests is minor cannabinoids having quite a huge effect Mm. impact therapeutically. And yet, you know, if you wanted to take that to a medical model analogy, it's it's not unheard of that doctors will, given a certain protocol to use certain drugs in a in a stepwise fashion or a, a yeah. prioritised strategy, they will uh, decrease a certain drug if it's not tolerated as well. Cancer yeah. is a classic example of that. Um, yeah. Epilepsy is another one. So it's not outside the realms of learning how to do it. It just requires no. some some dedication to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to really jump in here and learn about this stuff because my patients require it. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's, like, there's actually quite a bit of literature around um, how physicians feel in using medicinal cannabis and how, what, how, whether they're prepared. Oh, well, what was to... that? What was the result of that one? Um, so it actually showed that for, for the most part, um, this was a, I think this was a study coming out of the US that was a, um, they interviewed, I think it was a couple of hundred um, doctors and it was coming through medical school and they were just saying, how, what is your comfortability in, you know, if, if a patient approached you to use medicinal cannabis, how would you feel? And for the vast majority, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through memory here, it's about 70% or so of the practitioners were not comfortable really describing medicinal cannabis and so that's that's a huge barrier that's you know this is in 2017 i think that was reported but um even through other you know reading different papers through the literature you you can see that medicinal cannabis is being dosed at the wrong time um being and then you know being reported as being ineffective when they're using it as um a recovery i get i think it's recovery medication for antiemesis, where it actually needs to be given like prophylactically, prophylactically, yeah, before treatment. So there's definitely like it, even even if it is being used in a hospital, and it's you know you've got people on there's physicians and doctors applying it, the way it's being used is also skewing the evidence base again, potentially because we're getting these poor outcomes. But you look you look a little bit deeper, and you're like oh. You're giving it after the person, you know, if they've had a um, had chemotherapy and it's for on nausea and vomiting, then you're going to give it. Mm, it's probably not going to have the best outcomes. So prophylactically is really when it should be started. Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, that's generally like the dosing. That's the dosing guideline okay. when we're looking at it. Yeah, it's going to uh, if you're looking at for um, an antiemetic. Earlier rather than later. Yeah, not as a, res- a rescue medication. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gotcha. That's really yeah. interesting. So this yeah. really, like, I was speaking with Lucy Haslam about this and and she, of, of United in Compassion, for those people mm-hmm. that don't know her, the famous Lucy Haslam. And she was saying, this is probably going to be the biggest I told you so moment of <laughs> certainly in Australia. 
Um, <laughs> it's probably, you know, we were thinking about having T-shirts printed. <laughs> um, because patients are desiring it. They want their doctors to know about it. Mm. If they don't know about it, they, a lot of them are going to use it anyway. So yeah. it's in the doctor's best interest to know about it. And there are now courses being run by GPs, for GPs, um, yeah. to know about what is this drugs and how you can best help your patients by util utilising it. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, I was going to ask about preparations, you know, like the old way and, and you know, I'll go back into my <laughs> uni days here, you know, it's oh, it smoking and, thing. and and then, it, well, it was cookies and, and, you know, so you've got <laughs> both of those involve heating and then there was vaping which was a very Americanized strategy and one which I only learnt about after I finished my nursing training. But now, of course, I've been enlightened by this gorgeous young woman, incredibly strong young woman called Morgan Taylor, who has Crohn's disease, um, using fresh cannabis. So mm -hmm. there's no high. Now, this was really interesting to me. So the preparation, what do we need to learn about this plant about and and how does that affect the actions? What's the research showing us? Yeah, well, you know, if we go back to those key cannabinoids, CBD, uh, cannabidiol, and tetrahydrocannabinol (THC), those elements, you know, um, they require heating, uh, some form of decarboxylation to become active and have, you know, the the site the psychoactivity yep. that's aligned with those ones. So, if you, you know, if you're looking at a whole plant. And you're not heating it, and you're juicing it. Is that yeah? Is that, yeah, yeah. So you, you've got an an acid form of you know um, cannabidiol acid, um, tetrahydrocannabinol acid. Um, the list goes on, and you know these have therapeutic outcomes as well. It doesn't it doesn't require this the you know depending on. I think that's like it really speaks to the diversity of the plant. Oh. The fact that you can. You can use, depending on what your outcome, what it is that you're therapeutically looking to achieve, the plant, you can use the plant in the manner to get those outcomes. And, you know, that's the more we get to understand it through, you know, in terms of Crohn's disease. It seems like there's proof in the pudding now um, with this young lady um, having really wonderful outcomes with it. Oh, and absolutely. Just Taking the plant and 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 inducing it, and and not inducing, you know, the the um, decarboxylated elements, which then go on and have certain different effects in our body in the endocannabinoid system. Yeah. Um, now, you know, we've discussed previously about a you know a population approach to dosing seems not to be achievable. So, how can the evidence surrounding dosing be improved? What what needs to happen? Do we need to be you know, like Deddy Mieri has the, like, what is it, hundreds of different types. Um, like, 144 but, or last count. <laughs> yeah, how do you match that to a patient? Do you do, you do <laughs> genotyping? Do you do G SNP testing in a patient? Is it all mm -hmm. to do with liver tolerability? Like, uh, mm -hmm. what happens? What's your, what's your thoughts? Um, I think there's, there's definitely a lot. There's quite a broad field of, of variables to consider. Um, when using this, and I do, you know, this is where standardization definitely is a really, I, I think, an integral approach um, when we're looking at medicinal cannabis, knowing exactly what we're working with. Um, specifically, when we're looking at in oncology, we want to know exactly what's happening. That argument can go across all medical presentations, of course. But um, uh, there's a lot, a lot of different elements. You know, you can look at the pharmacogenomics around. Um, the endocannabinoid system, and then so we're getting into SNPs, and you know, there's the um, I think it's called the FAAH enzyme, which you know we know with CBD it regulates CBD. Um, so if we have um, a down, if we introduce CBD into the body, it down regulates the FAAH enzyme, which will increase your endogenous. Um, endocannabinoids, which has a right. certain therapeutic outcome that we're perhaps looking at. Um, and then, you know, we can also look at, like, when looking at tumours, there's the cannabinoid receptors on tumours. Can they provide any kind of idea around what kind of dose we're doing or, you know, what's, this, what's the approach, what's the ratio of um, medicinal cannabis that would have the most 
the, the most therapeutic outcome. Um, but then again, the, the literature says there's actually there's not really any um, congruence in those numbers to understand, oh, okay, this is a, you know, we'll go back to glioblastoma multiformat has these cannabinoid receptors. Yeah. But then that changes again across all different tumor presentations. Right, so it's not, okay. not something we can rely upon um, in terms of trying to be a bit more specific on dosing. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely the, you know, the endocannabinoids and the enzymes involved in the endocannabinoid system, something to look at. Um, liver is an, another element. But I think at, right at this point, there is a different, there's a limit in um, ability to quantify cannabinoids. So if we're looking at the pathology, you know, in terms of ph- pharmacokinetics, which is really important to be able to advise the safety of new medicines, mm. um, pharmacokinetic trials, um, they are lacking in this population, in, yeah. ca- in cancer populations and around medicinal cannabis. And, you know, there's a few reasons why that is, but even when we do capture it, it's that ability to measure it, you know, kind of limited with um, – there can be where it's a sensitivity presence where it's above 50, um, I think it's milligrams or what it is per litre in the blood of THC and you'll get a, a positive. But if it's below, then it's negative. That's not really going to give us a lot of information in terms of what's going on in the body. So there's the pathology is limiting a bit of yeah. that development into this area as well. And, and is that driven by that, you know, previous stigmatisation of cannabis? So they're always concentrating on on THC rather than CBD or the terpenes or, you know, the flavonoids. I mean, I, I, I know you've got the terpenes, there's a breadth of them. The flavonoids, there's a breadth of them. And then you've got the single CBD and THC. But there are a, yeah. a host of other chemicals involved in cannabis. Now, I know you yeah. can sort of th- think, oh, well, that means it makes it impossible but surely there's some way to to make broad groupings? Yeah, I think those biomarkers aren't well understood. I think it comes back to really not you know, broaden out the argument again, I guess. Um, you know, the endocannabinoid system was only really identified 25 yeah. plus years ago. Yeah. And so our ability to understand and, you know, develop biomarkers to understand once that, you know, the medicinal cannabis comes into our body and it's metabolized, where is it going and how do we measure that and how do we quantify it in order to deliver a, a, a more proficient, proficient um, dosing strategy or a, a how to titrate for this outcome. It, it's just not there at the moment. And I think it's something that is definitely a gap. We, you know, if we can find those biomarkers and get some good testing around it and develop assays that can make this much quicker so you understand like because yeah. at the moment with, with with titration it goes typically to um the individual's subjective views mm. like you go into your comfortability um if you're taking drops cannabis oil drops then you you start low of course and slowly build up over a week or two um to find your tolerability and you know it might be that you have bizarre dreams and you're like, oh, that was probably too much. Just drop it down 0.2 mils, and then that's where you're comfortable. Or you know, others, and then when you start looking at individual dosing, then that person A could go to 1.8 mils. Person B taking exactly the same can go to three mils a day, and they're both they're both presenting with the same. You know, well, ultimately looking at cancer, it's not one presentation. There's mm. multiple things going on, but they have the same. You know, same cancer presentation, but look at the different tolerabilities. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, when you talk about what's needed in the future, I think your career's mapped out. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> when, oh, I feel like I need to go study pharmacology after all this. <laughs> I've had I've had this like my do- my toes dipped into it. I'm like, whoa, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any clinical interactions that we need to be aware of? When, um, if a patient's using medicinal cannabis as an adjunct therapy, like, you know, we've got, you know, you mentioned dreams. I think we've spoken about, uh, was it nausea or something we spoke about prior where, you know, you'd just gone way too high? Oh, yeah. If, you know, if you've taken too much and not titrated the dose yeah. up and, like, had that awareness of how to use medicine, then there can be side effects. And in terms of interactions, um. 
you know, not a lot has been shown. And that, you know, we have to be mindful of liver function, kidney function, all the general generalities around that. Yep. But, yeah, I guess it's like any other, like it's a complementary medicine and understanding how these broader cons- constituents that come with complementary, how they interact and what's happening specifically in oncology is, is going to be continuous, I think. And, you know, there's a, there is that lack of pharmacokinetic studies when we're looking in, into this one, but it doesn't mean into medicinal cannabis, but there are, you know, there are, there is evidence that show people taking complementary therapy alongside medicinal cannabis, alongside your frontline treatments in cancer management. And there's not really, you know, a lot of the time you get a positive or an additive effect in terms of increasing chemosensitivity, um, radio sensitivity, things like that. Right. What else was covered on your poster, Daniel? Well, there's been, there's been a couple of them now. Um, ultimately, you know, we're looking at the, implications around it broke it down into administration of um medicinal cannabis and oncology and the different forms so we're looking at it predominantly through a capsule there's spray or a mucosal spray which is usually generally used for pain management um herbal tea and inhalation and of course the intratumoral administered um thc and what was noted across dosing um all 11 studies reported variable doses um, and all studies did use dose titration, which right. is it's really encouraging to see, you know, our, our knowledge around this area is definitely developing. Yeah. Um, but the big gap was that there was the absorption, um, you know, there was 17 studies reported um, in this literature review, which is the um, what the poster was on. Um and only four, or well, actually three, reported any kind of measures of cannabinoid levels. So you've got 17 potential, you know, they're not all RCTs, they're different elements of the evidence of a hierarchy, but there was a potential to measure it and it wasn't measured. And so when they encourage you going ahead, let's look at this stuff. Like, yeah. You know, it might not be your t- classic pharmacokinetic study where you're getting bloods every hour or every 15 minutes because of the patient population it can you know the ability to get people to sign up and be part of a pharmacokinetic trial when they're already under a lot of pressure um you know there's a lot of medical um intervention happening you you might not get those sign ups so it might be just looking at it a different way and i guess that goes into what my thesis um, is looking at and getting secondary data off um the trial happening, running run by Dr. Janet Sloss at the moment. So. Gotcha, right. You, you know, I, I wonder if that might um, might be different across cultures as well. Like you've got, uh, what was it, Portugal, where they have legalised, I think it was all illicit drugs or something, but um, then you've got Canada that's legalised cannabis. Various states in, in America have either legalised or decriminalised it. I may have this wrong. And there's different acceptances in various cultures um, like a normalcy of use, if you like. What I, what surprised me was elderly patients suffering pain um, seemed to be quite open. Now, this isn't cancer, obviously, but the elderly patients in pain seem to be quite open to the use of cannabis. Yeah, that, that's actually something that surprised me too, I guess, in these last um, couple of years or so, working um, in this field, having that privilege to sit with this herb for so long. Um, when I've spoken to, you know, that, that generation, they're the ones really waving the flag and going, "What? What is the problem here? Yeah. Why is there such a stigma?" Uh, it, like it, it completely, it wasn't what I expected. So similarly, as you felt, I was a bit blown away. I was like, "Well, this is great." Let's, you know, I think a lot of the drive going ahead on, you know, look, looking at policy development and whatnot, um, it's we need people. We need we need people power and patience and like that drive is there. It's so loud at the moment, and you know I think it is really loud for me because that's what I'm doing. But yeah. It's definitely making a buzz in the media, and you know that's it's a topical issue. And oh, it's, it's really high, highly stage. topical, highly topical, highly exciting. The movements that are being made, or hopefully being made, in Australia. Yeah. But w- what about 
Well, A, the future. Like, what do you see the future being, you know, given, let's say, the feeling of what's going on in the healthcare system? And can I ask you also about um, any red flags that we need to be aware of? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the red flags. I think it's it's really important to understand that this medicine, it's not everybody, it's not for everybody and you really have to understand certain elements you know there are the red flags around um mental health presentations if there's a history of it then oh, it's potentially yes. the wrong medicine for that person um and it's you know ultimately if you can be guided by a health practitioner while using this medicine amazing that's you know that's going to give you some really great outcomes but again you don't have to there are a lot of people who that there's that issue of compassionate access and people who have worked with this plant so long, they understand how to apply it. Um, but, yes, the biggest red flag is understanding mental health issues and the risks involved with that and not to jump in just because you saw that the, the, there was an outcome here over to the left. It doesn't mean it's going to be on your path. Yeah. Um, and going to... I guess going looking ahead in the future, I, I, it'd be wonderful to, you know, I think it comes as patient. We, we need to have uh, access be made accessible and yeah. not there's there. It's such a path now to try to get try and get access to this. Um, I think recently they showed, you know, the majority of patients getting legal access are, are getting it for pain management, and then you know. Second down the list at about that was about two thousand plus people getting access right. legally, um, and then second on the list was for cancer symptoms at about seven seven eight hundred people. Um, wow! So it is happening. I think it's you know that's exciting to hear, but it's also very minimal. And I think you know definitely from my experience in you know just talking with community and potential patients, people like that, they're not able to access it legally. Yeah. People are still using it. And that gap, like there has to be a way that if you're, you know, is there a place where you can go for information if you are accessing it, accessing it legally, uh, illegally, sorry. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if there was a platform you could come talk to and be like, look, I've got this. How can I use this to get therapeutic outcomes and not have that stigma around it? And it does seem a bit like a pipeline dream, <laughs> obviously, then the plant would be legal. And that would, it would be difficult to sit down with a health prof- practitioner, professional, and say, hey, I just got this off the corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what's in it. Yeah. Can you recommend how to dose it? Yeah, that's right. That's oh, exactly right. It's a bit tricky, but it would be great if there was – I just I would love that not to be the instance, you know, hey, I've got this plant. I don't know how to use it. And then you know we've got these, we've got these systems that um you know the MS pathology systems the MS GS um oh mass spec yes mass spec and mass gas chromatography spec. right yeah to be able to, like imagine if you could get something and you're oh my goodness I don't know what's in it and you can take it to a place and they go we'll run that for you and we've got these really quick tests that don't cost a lot and you're like oh it's got this this and this in it and you should dose it this way. Oh my goodness! And wow, by the way, amazing. it's been sprayed with, uh, <laughs> you know, umpteen different pesticides, so I wouldn't yeah, touch it. Yeah, don't talk about that. That's quite that, complicated. And that—that's a real issue. Enough. Well, that's a real issue, it, isn't it? It really is. It really is. Um, looking at those environmental aspects of the plant, um, and I think um, it was mentioned at the United in Compassion Conference, um, looking at, you know, ultimately the most cost-effective way to grow medicinal cannabis is outside in the environment with the sun, less use of pesticides as opposed to, you know, putting it in a little um, warehouse with controlled lighting and, you know, you'd have to then spray it to keep certain bugs out. And I think that that was, um, was that Eric uh, Eckerman? Uh, Simon, Simon Eckerman. Simon, I apologise. Yes, yeah, Simon. He was mentioning that. And I was just like, this is fantastic. It like, could be a cash economic... crop which could save Australian farmers. Yeah, the economic model is there. Yeah. It's just, you know, breaking down these barriers around, you know, the policy and different – you can't you can't take the human factor out of it and the values that each person will have. So, you know, you would talk political, we're talking about values and policy, we're looking at values, so – 
I don't know. It's just, it, we, we kind of, it would be great to have this big flip of the system. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> and let it, let it rattle all the way back down and you know, get some symmetry in there. Yeah. Certainly the um, practitioners who are willing to um, prescribe for their patients using the special access scheme category B, so the, mm-hmm. the SAS cap B, uh, they say now that it's a lot more streamlined than previously, that it's a lot easier to do. It takes only about 15 minutes. This is for our Australian listeners. There are, you know, ter- Dr. Teresa Taupik is doing work with the RACGP on training GPs on how to prescribe this drug um, effectively for, for patients. And, you know, United in Compassion obviously is doing the awesome work in Australia. But there are some training, mm-hmm. some other training people around the um, Australia as well. But... I note those. Um, Just before we get on to further resources, I did just want to ask one point, and it was about tolerability. Um, What about the various products that are on the market today? Like smoking was the traditional way of imbibing this substance. And then, of course, you've got baking and and vaping, and we've spoken about fresh juicing, um, which doesn't give a high. Uh, What about these liquids that are on the market? They've been extracted using heat, so they are or can be psychoactive mm-hmm. if there's THC. But what yeah. about tolerability? What about um, taste, for instance? It's, I, it's interesting. So I've looked, you know, across different doses, dosaging that's coming from the general market uh-huh. of how you would perhaps take CBD, for instance. And it's quite different to how it's being used in clinical trials. And I wonder, like, why is there a gap like that? Um you know, it's almost four times as much as what you would take in a, what's being used in a clinical trial. So right. that's something that I, I, I found really interesting. Yeah. Um, what is this knowledge gap? What? Why is this existing? Um, I don't know. Um, but, yes, typically, you know, traditionally it's been inhalation. Um, and, you know, that's going to get your the, the levels in your body within 10 minutes. You'll elicit an effect. Yeah. Um, However, when we're looking at oil, it's it's going to take a couple of hours um, for you to get that dose in your body, and um, but it will stay a lot longer. So that's why therapeutically, well, if we're looking, again, coming back to oncology, we want to keep that therapeutic levels at a steady state dose. We want a, 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 an oil to be able to carry the cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids as a complete of a, a, a cannabis-based medicine yep. into the body and right. elicit that response. Whereas using a whole plant, it's, I think, and, and as an inhalation, absolutely, it, it, it will look at pain management. It's going to get a quick response. Um, so so I'm so, going to guess then, say, for pain management, antiemesis, those sort of things that you need an action right now, please, um, <laughs> that inhaling the product is going to be the best form. But then patients might well have to balance that out with an overnight dosage of a, a longer-acting product. Yeah, again, it, it really comes back to what the presentation is and what the therapeutic outcomes that are wanted are. Um, you know, traditionally, it has been. You, you look back in the 70s and 80s, the literature, into the 90s, it's inhalation. It's being provided cig- cannabis cigarettes and inhalation using it in oncology as yeah. inhalation. Yeah. And you perhaps will get that quicker response if you're feeling unwell. Maybe that's going to work for you. Again, we come back full circle. It's individual. Yeah. It might not work for you. It might work for them and not the other person. Yeah. And yeah. Mm. We certainly need a lot more information, but where can we get further resources on this, Danielle? I think United in Compassion in Australia is a really great resource to jump in and really understand you get a get an understanding of what's happening um, in terms of access in Australia. Um, There's certain, you, you know, just, I think the first point, of course, would be if, if you're looking to use this medicine, speak to your GP. Um, and that's probably the best, the, the first point source, I think, or, you know, your trusted health professional, someone you know who can guide you to the right direction. There's certain cannabis access clinics and whatnot. So in terms of getting access, that would be the point I'd look for. But if we're looking, you know, into the research and whatnot, um, just put it in Google. <laughs> You'll get a ton of papers, medicinal cannabis, you know, just in oncology. Um, 
and and it really you start your kind of rabbit hole <laughs> tuition down, down there. It yeah. takes you all kinds of layers, um, but it's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely, um, Danielle. Thank you so much for taking us through. I mean, it is a rabbit hole, yes, but it's a it's a necessary rabbit hole which patients are crying out for in need. Um, and they, they certainly want this and they want their healthcare practitioners, their doctors, their specialists to be empowered and, and armed with knowledge rather than uh, stigma. So yeah, I, 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 I really urge our, our healthcare practitioners, I would say all healthcare practitioners out there, mm-hmm. um, not just GPs, but naturopaths, herbalists, everybody really needs to know about this stuff if you Absolutely. want to help your patients with these conditions which cannabis has shown to be of use. But thank you so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. The FX Medicine team would like to thank the enormous generosity of all our guests who have graciously donated their time, their expertise and their stories of both triumph and adversity. Most of all, we'd like to thank you, our listeners, for your continued feedback and support and for giving us direction and purpose as we move forward together into the future. 